think as uh, um, explained earlier, would, I'd like to call on Pierre Ferrand back to the floor and uh, with apologies, Pierre. So um, I suggest that if you could um, continue with your presentation um, midstream or where you left off. Yeah, I mean, that the second part of the presentation, so. Perfect. Okay. And, and maybe uh, if you know. could just give a, a quick uh, recap of what has been presented. Thank you okay. for that. Okay, so everyone can see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. So in the, in the first part of the presentation, I have highlighted some of the impacts of COVID-19 on agriculture and food security. Please mute all the non-speakers. Um, and uh, now I will highlight more how agroecology can contribute to build greener, more resilient and more inclusive new normal. So, as I highlighted in the, the first part of the presentation, there was a focus on labor and job markets, on agricultural inputs, and also access to the market. So, now I will uh, present how agroecology can address this kind of impact. So, first of all, regarding labor with the creation of decent agricultural jobs. So, agroecology coal system are highly diverse and complex and they are based on careful management of various elements of the socio-ecological system. They provide strong and resilient local, regional and global marketing opportunity for agricultural produce. So in that regard, there is a possibility to create decent jobs in the agricultural sector involving diverse areas of competence spanning from ecology to marketing to rural development. There is a need to invest in education to equip the young generation with skills to require to perform high quality knowledge intensive jobs. And there is also a need to connect with investment targeted at increasing the value of high quality agricultural products through certification or the protected origin, for instance, and payment for ecosystem services and other externalities. Regarding agricultural input, uh, agroecology offer an extensive array of agricultural methods, techniques and economic approaches that help farmers reducing their dependency on external input and increase resilience of farming system. So replacing external input such as fertilizer, pesticides, seeds, animal medication and moving towards stewardship and better utilization of ecosystem services is a central component of agroecological transition. Also, we can add strengthening local input system and establishing well-functioning community seed bank. Finally, supporting the utilization and propagation of local variety and underutilized species is very important since they are well adapted to specific and local conditions and providing the basis, the basis for nutrient-rich, diverse and healthy diet. Lastly, regarding the, the market, connecting farmers to consumers, it's highly important to, uh, to empower producers and to have the establishment of producer organizations that are strong since it's, central, it's a central element of agroecological system. Uh, increased, this provides increased opportunity for farmers to defend their appropriate place in the market and obtain fair prices for the produce. So there is an important role to be played by the government through public procurement in supporting green transformation of food system. Not only, I mean, first by sourcing products from farmers or farmers group with production method complying with high standard of environmental and social sustainability. But also we need to highlight that the procurement of food produced according to agroecological standards not only create market opportunity for high quality products from family farmers, but also help to assure free or at least affordable access to LC and safe products for beneficiary of government program. So here are some example of um, initiative that can help connecting farmers to consumers. One is a community supported agriculture. So this kind of scheme is a partnership of mutual commitment between farm and community of supporters. And as one of the CSA scheme put it, the nearer the source, the stronger the relationship between farmers and citizens and the more secure the food supply. So below the picture highlight two examples of uh, CSA, one in Yangon in Myanmar and the other one is a CSA China 
uh, network, which gather over 1,000 different CSA farms across the country. Another uh, initiative is e-commerce platform, which have boomed during the pandemic. And I would like to specifically focus on e-commerce platform that prom promote open source, not-for-profit and community control platform, such as the Open Food Network, because they both enable farmers to connect to eaters and to collaborate with other farmers. And this kind of platform envision decentralized food system made up with thousands of independent and diverse distribution hub reconnecting producers to customers. So to finish, few takeaway message out of this presentation. First of all, agroecological principle offer valuable approaches that can help increasing resilience of food system and represent a coping strategy to mitigate immediate disruption caused by a pandemic such as COVID-19. The resilience of agroecological system is achieved by increasing the diversity of the system, replacing external input with ecological processes, efficient use and recycling of the resources in the system. Sale and distribution of product in agroecological system is based on strong farmers organization and direct connection between producers and consumers. And I believe that we will have very good example shared by AFA and other partners later on during this side event. Short and stable supply chain ensure stable market for both sellers and buyers during time of disruption, such as a pandemic. Last but not least, it's very critical to have investment to, made, uh, to be made to up and outscale the use of agroecology and supporting a green future for post-pandemic agriculture. This is especially important for education and research on sustainable agricultural practices and agroecology to create a new generation of professionals in the agricultural sector equipped with the knowledge, skill and competence required to support and lead the agroecological transition. And then also to develop and further expand schemes allowing for fair compensation of positive externalities associated with agricultural production. Here we can mention the direct payment for ecosystem services, fair market access, or participatory guarantee system as a certification process. So to go further, I strongly encourage you to scan or to, uh, I mean, you will have the link anyway after this presentation to the agroecological, uh, agroecology knowledge hub that is managed by FAO and gather all resources you can, uh, you need about agroecology, also to the community of practice on agroecology and family farming that has been launched at global level and very soon we'll have one focusing more on Asia and Pacific and also the full technical paper uh, out of which I have extracted some findings. So thank you very much for your attention and feel free to reach out if you want to discuss further about this and how we can support you in order to implement agroecological transition. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you, Pierre, for opening our panel session with some intermission, which are very important, drum beating of agroecology. It's an imperative to a more resilient and inclusive new normal, especially its promise of decent agricultural jobs, reducing dependency to external inputs and connecting farmers to consumers and the need for greater investments to make these things happen. Now we move on to our next speaker. May I call on Esther Penunia to speak about the initiatives of family farming organizations to achieve SDGs and implement UNDFF or the UN Decade for Family Farming through multi-stakeholder COVID-19 responses. Esther, you have seven minutes. Uh, thank you, Marlene. I, am, I have asked Irish Dominado, colleague of, from AFA, to share my presentation in the screen. And good morning to all of you today. And in behalf of the AFA, we thank you for coming back again after that. Uh, <laughs> not so good, but still we are able to surpass it uh, incident. So today we would like to share with you our initiatives on COVID-19 responses within the framework of the UN Decade on Family Farming and how these initiatives contribute to the achievement of the SDGs. So, uh, Irish, can you can you share the presentation in the screen? Um, Marlene, I cannot see the presentation in the screen. So, um, if we have copy of your presentation. If yeah, you can, wish, we can yes, do that. Please. Okay. So I don't know what happened to Irish Dominado. <laughs> I think she's still suffering from shock. From <laughs> 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 
Can you get the latest one? Anyway, I, I have it. Okay. I am, yeah, I am you, not sure if this is the late. Yeah. <laughs> Can you start with the, the first one? Yes, please. Okay. Yes. Okay, then we go to the next slide. So currently we have 22 member organizations in 16 countries in Asia, and our members are national farmers associations and or farmers cooperatives. Next slide. Our current work is within the framework of the Global Action Plan of the United Nations Decade of Family Farming 2019 to 2028, attracting the youth to agriculture under Pillar 2, women farmer empowerment under Pillar 3, strengthening the governance and organizational management of farmers associations and cooperatives under Pillar 4, sustainable climate resilient agroecological approaches in farms, fisheries, and forests under Pillar 6 and 7, Securing rights of family farmers, especially with their natural resources such as lands, waters, forests, seeds under pillar, pillars one and five. Next slide, please. At the onset of the COVID-19 in our countries, we asked our members to monitor the situation and then conducted online sharing sessions. From these sessions, we produced and widely disseminated in April a statement on farmers as frontliners during COVID-19, as it is probably the first statement issued by a regional farmer organization on the pandemic. As IFAD is our key development partner, uh, please click. We also made a video appeal to the IFAD president to turn the challenges into opportunities for family farmers by directly financing our organizations. In response, IFAD allowed us to utilize funds from our existing project to respond to uh, COVID-19. We then asked our members and partners to document their stories on challenges and responses in print and video, which you can view from our website. And we have specifically put tabs for COVID-19 impact and resource and responses. The circle here that uh, is, are the responses done by FOs and they can be categorized into three. Relief, such as the distribution of food packs, sanitation and hygiene products for affected families done in Myanmar, Philippines, Vietnam, India, Nepal and Bangladesh. Second is rehabilitation, such as conduct of awareness campaign, developing policy messages, sharing sessions, linking to markets, and provision of loans by cooperatives in majority of countries. And third set of category of response is reconstruction, such as engaging in partnership for marketing of farmers produce either offline or online in majority of countries, and then submitting a proposal to IFAD on assuring resiliency of family farmers amidst COVID-19, which was eventually approved and, in, and in, is in its startup implementation. We also launched a Food Hero campaign with face mask and distributed this to our partners. And you can find our video in this link. Next, please. Since you are looking for multi-stakeholder partnerships, these are some of the examples. First, using their own funds, Mongolia's agri-cooperative NAMAX branch sued face mask and donated to the Provincial Emergency Commission. In India, Sewa produced 5 lakh face masks and distributed to consumers in nearby villages and towns. In Myanmar, FOFFM partnered with labor unions and sold farmers produced in industrialized zones. AFA member in Philippines and partner in Bangladesh helped secure, repack, and distribute seeds from local agriculture centers. They also became, uh, sorry, it's too fast, can you go back? They also became useful conduits in delivering support and assistance to farm families. And AFA member in Laos partnered with the LGU and a local logistics company to bring organic vegetables to the capital. Next slide, please. Let us take a closer look with one case with an all-women farmer cooperative called Kagat from indigenous uh, community of Dumaga Tremontado who are fighting against the construction of the mega Kaliwa Dam, which will flood and possibly displace their communities. Kagat, with linkages from its national FO Pakisama, established a weekly farmer's market in partnership with the Homeowners Association of a low-cost subdivision and with the Department of Agriculture in a pilot farmer's market in Tondo, one of the poorest communities in Metro Manila. 
It also partnered with a religious institution. You can see the, the photo here from the, the, the photo below. Uh, who bought more than a thousand food packs, which are ingredients for local food, Sinigang, Pakbet, and Laing, for its food assistance to poorer communities. It also partnered with a startup enterprise doing online marketing direct to households. In the process, Kagat increased the farm gate price by 25%, decreased retail price by 5%, provided fresh local vegetables, created jobs for seven people with youth, and strengthened the organizations, and expanded their partnerships, and contributing to SDGs 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 8, 10, 11, 12, 15, 16, and 17. I hope you will agree. Okay, next. The Global Agriculture for Food Security Program is a multilateral funding which works to improve food and nutrition security through effective partnerships, strategic development, and targeted use of funds. Its governance structure is unique. Its steering committee is composed of representatives from donor governments, recipient countries, UN agencies, regional multilateral finance institutions, and CSO producer organizations. The three CSO reps are ROPA for Africa, AFA for Asia, and Action Aid USA for Northern NGOs. The Gaps We Miss in Middle project in Bangladesh, uh, next please, uh, provides direct financing to 55 subnational farmers' organizations and cooperatives in the North and South regions, as well as to their national FO. FAO Bangladesh is the supervising entity. The FOs established 57 virtual call centers. The VCCs have youth operators with an Android phone. They provide business information, places orders to local input dealers and service providers, and negotiate with local traders. The operator has access to the profile of all members, the details about up and downstream value chain actors, and partners with a rickshaw driver for pickup and deliverables of supply. Next. Lastly, you may have heard of the UN Food System Summit called for by the UN Secretary General. I'm sorry. Here is the diagram from FAO that shows how the UNDFF supports the SDGs and how the SDGs support the UNDFF. So it, it, it uh, affects, uh, it, co it contributes to all the 17 and SDGs. I hope the examples we gave can attest to this mutual support relation between UNDFF and the SDG. Next, please. Lastly, you may have heard of the UN Food Systems called for by the UN Secretary in 2019. The summit hopes to launch bold new actions to del deliver progress on all 17 SDGs, realizing that each of the SDGs rely to some degree on healthier, more sustainable, and equitable food systems. In this next slide, we can say that uh, the the, U the Food System Summit is a solution summit. There are five action tracks, ensure and safe nutritious food for all, shift to sustainable consumption pattern, boost nature positive production, advance uh, equitable livelihoods, and build resilience to vulnerable shocks and stresses. AFA, can you click? AFA is in action one and has led the game-changing idea on neglected and underutilized crops and school feeding program we are in Action Track 3 as well, where we co-led a game-changing solution on agroecology, and we are beginning to take part in Action Track 4. We would like to highlight the role of cooperatives in achieving the SDGs under this Action Track 4. Also, APA decided to, to get involved because we know that nothing about us without us. The FSS train will move with or without us. And we want to make efforts to articulate our, our perspective, solutions, and influence the process inside while respecting the values of those who decide to engage outside the process. Next, please. It is a people summit. It is a people summit, and there are four kinds of multi-stakeholder dialogues being conducted. Member state dialogues convened by countries, uh, by governments, but uh, encourage and anticipating and expecting that these are multi-stakeholder dialogues, so CSOs should be invited here. And then we have global dialogues, upcoming one on water in April 27. In April 27, and then we have regional dialogues, and we have we are working with the SAC, uh, SAC Agriculture Center, with FAO, and with the International Cooperative Alliance, 
AP at Asia Pacific to conduct a dialogue on FSS with UNDFF sometime in August also. And also independent dialogues uh, where anyone, any organization can conduct an independent dialogue on FSS. Just submit online uh, your, your dialogue and the results of the, your dialogue so that it can feed into the FSS processes. So that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Esther, um, for sharing how AFA and uh, your member farmers organization face the challenges of COVID-19 head on and how it has been benefited the well-being of farmers and their families and communities. Thank you also for highlighting the important role of family farmers in the uh, achievement of priority SDGs, that uh, important uh, message that nothing about us without us is something that uh, should reverberate in as many uh, policy discussions uh, across the globe at different levels. So moving on to our next speaker, um, our third speaker, may I now call on Ms. Maalini Ramalo to speak about the COVID-19 actions and the promise of territorial uh, rural development uh, in responding to sustainable development uh, 2030. Maalini, you have seven minutes. Maalini, you are on mute. Oh yeah, thank you for allowing, um, for unmuting myself. Um, I'm trying to share the screen, but however, it says here that the host has disabled participants screen sharing. So um, may, may I request the tech team to open the unlock the screen sharing for Maalini? Thank you. Yes, Maalini, it's now enabled. All right, thank you. Let's do it quickly. All right. Um, So, um, yep, I'm representing um, Asia Draw today. i um, glad to be here. I'm Malini. I'm the Director for Social Protection in Draw Malaysia. Um, so, um, moving on, um, I'd like to share about the network um, Asia Draw, which is well known as well, and um, a partnership network from 11 Asian countries. Um, so uh, it is dedicated to the rural development and poverty eradication and works for the empowerment for rural people's organization. It is envisioned to take lead roles in territorial rural development because they are financially stable, able to operate viably, innovate and reinvest, um, able to provide services to a significant proportion of community population and able to participate in local development um, training. So um, during the pandemic, um, we were able to safeguard gains of work on the ground through member draws um, who are present in the 11 countries and partner with rural people organization. And the experiences that we have validated the relevance of work of building community resiliency by empowering, empowering RPOs and local associations. Apart from that, um, you know, we were able to set commitment and direction that aims to transform the way we think and act together with fellow RDP stakeholders in the context of the new normal. Um, of course, it also reiterated that you know, the ability to take quick action responses thanks to the flexibility of development partners uh, like the EU, IFAD and FAO for allowing partners to react and respond based on the realities faced on the ground. I think um, this is very, very essential in a lot of our implementation. And um, again, um, you know, it also reiterated the SDG 17 partnerships that calls upon that development assistance should be responsive, anchored on trust and confidence among partners to enable the delivery of tangible benefits for the people and communities who are not simply beneficiaries, but active participants of the development process. Um, Please allow me to share um, some of the COVID-19 actions uh, response that uh, some of our partner countries has undertaken uh, during and as we go through the uh, crisis. 
in Cambodia, uh, Cambodra and the Farmer in Nature Net implemented a water on the farm to improve healthy sanitary practices, especially of women and children. A poultry stock distributions and vegetable net houses and emergency cash assistance and a food security income and employment through the agriculture value chain um, was implemented. And um, in Indonesia, our partner Indra and RPO partners worked, uh, resulted in local marketing of an indigenous hand sanitizer, a food bank, a quarantine isolation facility established by Women Farmers Union, a jimpitan or a rice donation traditional practice by the youth, a food solidarity action by RPOs in Yogyakarta and South Sulawesi, and a community-based platform for seeds and products exchange. And meanwhile, in the Philippines, um, Fildra oriented 1,150 families in Mindanao on health and safety protocols with LGU, provided food packs and hygiene kits to 4,500 households, including indigenous um, peoples, trained and provided capital for livelihood recovery for 244 women micro-entrepreneurs, mobilized material human resources for relief goods, PPEs, wage subsidies, and warehouse benefiting 76,000 families. And also co-organized series of webinars um, and conveyed the CSO uh, DRM hub to effectively coordinate and emergency response during disasters and calamities. And meanwhile, in Malaysia, um, Draw Malaysia catalyzed the formation and led um, COVID Care MY, which is a uh, 21 organization coalition to support 10,000 over vulnerable families nationwide by addressing basic needs such as grocery aid, mental health support, legal advice, particularly the elderly, below the 40 poverty line groups, stateless, undocumented families, unemployed, and people who have just lost jobs and other unlisted um, vulnerable groups. In summary, we contributed in the response phase through education and information campaign um, to address knowledge and gaps among the poorest and geographically isolated members of the rural people's organization. We had small scale psychosocial services to address anxieties, fear, depression, and overall psychological and mental health of local partners. Diversification of agriculture production to address issues of food scarcity due to disruption in the food supply chain and increase in price of food products. Small social infrastructures, portable water supply system to improve access to for farming households to save water, improve hygiene and sanitation practices, improvement of social protection system, whether it's through credit and saving services of farmer organizations, recalibration of marketing and business plans, as many efforts lost their lucrative market value um, due to restrictions in mobility and the business closure and exploring food hubs that connect producers and consumers. And lastly, virtual learning exchanges um, on the COVID-19 experiences and challenges facing the DRAS and EFOS. Amidst the constraints, uh, we work, our work continued and we were able to deliver the expected results. Um, you know, we had the freedom to reorient cooperation and flexibility of partners allowed that. Um, timely organizational efforts to retrofit and calibrate operational systems to keep our own people safe and to adapt strategies with the changing times. High value of social capital and trusting relationship of Asia Dra network with national and subnational partners, stable, strong relations of draws with grassroots communities, allowing to work together in solidarity amid the constraint. And again, once of all, um, it affirms the title of today's site event, which is strong partnership, horizontally and vertically, multi-stakeholder partnership have served as our antidote against the pandemic. And with that, um, moving forward um, for the recover recovery phase and the next 10 years of SDGs, um, Asia Dra's new strategic action plan for 2021-2025 promotes the institu 
institutionalization of territory rural development as a central approach to sustainable inclusion of development, which responds to SDG 1, 2, 8, 10, 12, 13. ASEAN through the uh, SOM RDP will draft in uh, will be drafted in 2021 the ASEAN Rural Development Master Plan, which could promote the importance of an integrated bottom-up planning with local participation of key rural actors, smallholders, rural women, and rural young people, empowered, well-organized local association RPOs able to influence relevant decision-making process and lead in the development intervention in our territories. Um, strong RPO build community resiliency and will speed up the localization of SDG targets and investing in human resource development and capacitating local actors to engage with stakeholders at levels uh, preconditions to the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goal 2030 in the next 10 years. All right, thank you. Thank you, Maalini. And uh, it cannot be seen on the video. Maalini is eight months heavy. And uh, so <laughs> thank you so much for all that energy uh, uh, towards the presentation of our report. And um, especially thanks for sharing the importance of investing in developing strong partnerships up to the grassroots level as a barrier to pandemics. and. Thanks also for mentioning that territorial approaches are viable option to address the integrated nature of the SDGs, which can they can complement and improve cross-sectorial effectiveness as well as increase coordination and meaningful participation. For our fourth speaker, uh, I'd like us to call on uh, Anselmo D to uh, share to us the initiatives of the Asian, the Asian Partnership of Civil Society Organizations for Sustainable Development. And Selma, you have five, seven minutes. Okay, yeah, now. Thank you for inviting and congratulations your very effective evacuation plan. <laughs> very good example of resilience. <laughs> Uh, my name is Anselmo Lee. I'm here in Seoul, South Korea. I'm the regional coordinator of APSD, as introduced by Malini. Uh, I send a PowerPoint. Could you please, uh, your technical team, upload uh, my PowerPoint? As you may know, the APSD was created 2016 as a network of regional NGO. Now we have about 16 regional NGO, including Aishadra, to, uh, to facilitate the cooperation vertically, global and national local, and also horizontally among regional NGOs. So this is the purpose of the APSD. So we are part of the global platform called A4, as the Action for Sustainable Development, which coordinate the global monitoring of SDGs. And then we have an interesting project, People's Call Card, uh, because this is a very participatory project to monitor the delivery of SDG nationally, but we hope in the future to uh, develop people's call card, not only national, but also sectoral, which means it can be farmers, it can be also migrants as well. Oh, now we have a PowerPoint. Next slide, please. Okay, we are also part of APRCM, as you know, is a, which is a CSO platform for engagement APFSD. And also some of you may be interested in the G20 summit uh, because APSD is a regional platform of uh, Asia, regional platform for G20. And also I'm personally working for, as a global co-chair of C20 working group on 2030 agenda. Next slide, please. Um, like many other regional NGOs, uh, APA stress very much human rights-based approach to SDG, especially the linking voluntary national review on SDG and also UPR, universal period review. So as you know, we have a two global agenda. One is a human rights, the other one is SDG. But unfortunately, so far, there's no uh, convergence, there's no synergy. So we are trying to promote the linking these two for synergy effect because many of those uh, same CSOs engage the one way human rights, the other way the, the SDGs. 
And for, as I briefly mentioned, the People's Scorecard, uh, this year we are targeting all the VNI countries and hopefully next year all the uh, Asian countries so that we can compare internationally. Uh, at the same time, uh, the sectoral one, you know. So I want to share briefly, uh, recently, uh, one of the key members of APSD and also personally, I was heavily involved in the uh, uh, Kathmandu Democracy Forum focusing on uh, COVID-19 and SDG and human rights. I want to share the, some of the key recommendations which I think are relevant to today's uh, the event, panel discussion. Next slide, please. So basically, while listening to the presentation by FAO and also our uh, Ashadra members, I was looking at uh, impact of uh, COVID-19 on agriculture or farmers linking to SDG 16 and 17. Somehow, I did not see much the emphasis on the, the linking to SG 16 and 17. And we are already five years after adoption of SG, but there is a tendency that they look at their own the goals without being linked to the SG 16 and 17. That's why uh, this 16 and 17 is a missing link. And and also in the decade, uh, as you know, the UN Decade for Action to deliver SDG by 2030, UN very much stressed how can you overcome the silo approach. So in that context, 16 uh, considered as an enabler and accelerator, which means you know to have a more successful imp implementation of uh, agriculture goal to and other related goal, I think it's important to integrate SG 16 and 17. So I want to highlight especially the four targets of SG 16. 16 and 6 is effective institution, 7 is a participatory decision making, and 16 and 10 access to information, B non-discrimination, which means uh, leave no one behind principle. So I think this is not only the general, the sector, but specifically the agriculture and farmer sector, I think important to implement the SG 16 principles. And also when it comes to SG 17, we have a means of implementation. As some of you already mentioned about means of implementation in relation to agriculture. But I want to stress once again, this a policy coherence and multi-stakeholder partnership, especially when it comes to agriculture in the process of resilience. I think we need to redesign a multi-stakeholder partnership among the farmers as a producer and the consumers, which means it is a link to SVG 12, sustainable consumption production. So when you look at the COVID-19, it's not only health, public health issues. When you go to the deep, the root causes of the COVID-19, many people were pointing out the unsustainable consumption production and climate change. So which means we need to broaden our partnership uh, with uh, other groups as well, you know. And the lastly, data. So we don't have sufficient data about agriculture and farmers. So I think that has to be also uh, strengthened. So finally, so let me introduce a few concrete recommendations. The next slide, please. So there are, uh, among the many other, uh, about there are 17 recommendations. I want to highlight five. I pick up five, this recommendation to government IGO, including the ASEAN and also UN agency, even the World Bank and ADB. Number one is uh, effective, accountable, transformative, uh, transparent institutions. Number two, consider CSO act, uh, as an independent actor and partner. Number three, co policy coherence. Number four, inequality vaccine. Then lastly, I want to really stress corporate accountability among multinational corporations because not only the pharmaceutical company, but also we have a big agro business uh, transnational corporations. So we have a UN principle, a uh, guiding principle on business and human rights and many others. I think it's a really high time when you redesign the agricultural paradigm after coronavirus, I think the corporate accountability is one of the key issues we need to advocate to make more uh, sustainable and consumption production, especially in the agricultural sector. Thank you for your uh, uh, attention. Melina, over to you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Anselmo, for uh, 
highlighting the importance of com connecting many of our actions related to other SDG goals, especially seven, 16 and 17. And, and, uh, and that's why we think your participation in this forum, among other organizations, we have uh, a lot more of interaction, but uh, the presence of uh, APSD should uh, precisely remind us the importance of uh, connecting our work to these two important uh, goals that looks at uh, which are, as we you say, both enabler, accelerator, and SDG 17 as the means of implementation. And thank you for uh, that important uh, challenge or agenda of looking at the connecting to the, the work of farmers organizations cooperative to the importance of looking at the business ethics uh, and at the moment it is at the, uh, referring to the ASEAN guidelines on responsible agriculture investment and I think there's that opportunity to connect. So but without much ado I would finally though not the least our fifth speaker may I call on Dr. Sita Sumrit assistant division and head of poverty eradication and gender uh, division of the Human Development Directorate of the ASEAN Secretariat. She will be presenting ASEAN's initiatives on responding to uh, and recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic and initiatives on SDGs. Sita, you have the floor and you have a bonus. You have 10 minutes. Sita, I think you are on mute. Okay, I, I was not able to unmute, so now it's okay now. So thank you very much, uh, Malin, for uh, the invitation to the ASEAN Secretariat to participate in this uh, site event. Uh, the ap apology from our side that Director Rodora cannot make it today, so she assigned me to present uh, on her behalf. So for the presentation from the ASEAN Secretariat, uh, we will focus on the multi-stakeholder partnerships uh, and um, with our work on recovery uh, from COVID-19 as well as on uh, SDGs. Next slide, please. So uh, for the ASEAN initiatives on responding to and recovering from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, a number of uh, action and strategic initiatives have been taken at the regional level uh, in order to leverage the regional cooperation to respond. So before we recover, uh, ASEAN has responded to the pandemic. Starting from uh, April last year, uh, at the very onset of the pandemic, uh, ASEAN leaders uh, have issued the declaration of the Special ASEAN Summit um, on COVID-19, which provided strategic policy guidance on key areas. Uh, back then were the Public Health Corporation, uh, Regional Epidemic Preparedness and Response, as well as um, prioritizing the well-being of the people uh, in ASEAN through the engagement with uh, multiple stakeholders. Uh, there was also the joint statement with the ASEAN Plus 3 uh, Summit um, and we highlighted this because this also highlights um, the importance of partnership and this time with um, Plus 3 countries, uh, China, Japan and Korea, also in April um, to um, identify possible areas of collaboration, especially in the area of health. Uh, trade and investment, as well as post-pandemic recovery. Next slide, please. So from uh, political commitments, um, we also would like to emphasize here the strategic policy directions um, that are given through all these um, political um, instruments and documents. So uh, we just listed here just for the overall picture of uh, the immediate responses uh, by our leaders and ministers including the ASEAN health ministers as well as the ASEAN ministers working on social welfare and development and this one is important as um, it also provides 
policy guidance uh, on um, the protection of vulnerable groups, uh, including women, children, people with disabilities, as well as um, the poor. So this, this uh, that's why we put it here. And then uh, second, I think this is perhaps most uh, relevant uh, to the sector that we've been uh, working on, especially with Asia DRA. So the joint statement of the ASEAN Minister meeting on rural development and poverty eradication. So the focus was on uh, reducing poverty, but also building resilience, making sure uh, that our development gains are not being reversed by the pandemic, especially on uh, poverty reduction. So here, um, this joint statement uh, provided guidance for us uh, to pay attention to the protection of the poor and vulnerable in the rural sector uh, to safeguard and uh, invigorate rural livelihoods and ensure a poor, poor, inclusive gender and climate responsive approach. So it's, it's very comprehensive uh, itself, this policy guidance from uh, the rural development and poverty eradication uh, sector. Uh, special emphasis uh, was given to rural women and rural youth as uh, they are, of course, not only vulnerable, but valuable uh, through the process of building resilience uh, and, to, and for us to recover from the pandemic. Next slide, please. Thank you, Ajeng. So uh, these are, uh, just to make things easier, as ASEAN has uh, many uh, ministerial bodies as well as uh, the uh, working sectors uh, itself. So we just listed here that uh, there have been um, active uh, responses and um, policy guidance given by uh, all these uh, ministerial um sectors of ASEAN from the ASEAN Political Secu Security Corporation to the ASEAN Economic Community as well as the ASEAN Social Cultural Community. So these are of course uh, the examples of uh, partnerships not only with external partners but also uh, the cross-sectoral cross-pillar nature of the ASEAN uh, solidarity in coping with uh, the current crisis of COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Next slide, please. So here, uh, we would like to bring your attention to uh, this very important ASEAN rapid assessment. I hope that this will be uh, useful to all the participants here. If you would like to have a look, the link is here or you can just Google. So uh, we have done the ASEAN rapid assessment of the impact of COVID-19 on livelihoods across ASEAN with the uh, Asia Foundation. And this is uh, um, approved by the uh, social welfare and development sector of ASEAN. So here we listed the key findings that ASEAN member states have initiated economic stimulus packages to respond uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic. Also in terms of the labor related policy responses, uh, there were, well, there have been income support for the affected workers, training support, reemployment programs, and all that. Um, <clears throat> there's also um, the approximate numbers of response measures uh, that were introduced by the ASEAN member states related to social assistance and social insurance uh, measures, as well as um, the analysis on the um, availability of guidelines on health and safety for the students, youth, and uh, what 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 has been happening in terms of uh, protection of young people and uh, schools during the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So please uh, feel free to check this out uh, if you have time and if you are interested in this rapid assessment. Next slide, please. So now we'll go into the comprehensive recovery framework uh, and action plan of ASEAN. So um, ASEAN, of course, um, has attempted to strengthen our efforts um, and adopt this uh, ASEAN comprehensive recovery framework, given the vast areas uh, that ASEAN as a region um, is covering as well as what what uh, the 
the exponential um, extent of uh, the areas that we need to work together to ensure effective uh, recovery from the COVID-19. So as you can see here, um, there are key principles, objectives, as well as the approach that we are uh, adopting uh, to implement this uh, comprehensive recovery framework. It's also available on ASEAN website if you want to look at it in details. Next slide, please. So here, I think this uh, gives us um, a bit more structured uh, picture of how uh, we will go about this uh, re recovery framework of, of ASEAN. So there are five broad strategies uh, to implement this framework. So the first one is enhancing health systems. I think this uh, this is a common sense that COVID-19 pandemic started as a health crisis, but also to strengthening human security. And this is broad strategies to uh, touching upon the real people of ASEAN and humans, uh, uh, human development and human security. Um, broad strategy number three is on um, more on the uh, ensuring that our economy continue uh, to prosper. Um, especially in terms of the economic integration. Number four is uh, ex accelerating inclusive digital transformation. So leverage on um, the new technologies and um, innovation uh, to uh, recover from the pandemic. And number five, of course, I think this is uh, the umbrella to all the broad strategies as we aim to advance towards a more sustainable and resilient uh, future. Next slide, please. I'll go faster uh, as I have 10 minutes. So these are just uh, some examples of development cooperation uh, with a uh, partner um, in the context of uh, COVID-19. So uh, with China, the EU, the US, uh, as well as Russia, among others. Next slide, please. As for, this is the third part uh, of our presentation on the ASEAN initiatives uh, on SDGs. Again, I would like to uh, underscore here the complementarities initiative and roadmap. Uh, and what we mean by complementarities is the complementarity between the ASEAN Community Vision 2025 and the UN um, agenda on uh, SDGs. So uh, these are uh, the roadmap led by Thailand with the support from UNSCAP um, to ensure that our efforts to achieve inclusive and sustainable development uh, are in line uh, with the SDGs. And at the same time, the implementation of the SDGs will also enhance uh, the realization of the ASEAN Vision 2025. So these are uh, one of the uh, some of the platforms uh, for for policy exchanges that come with this complementarities roadmap, including the ASEAN Regional Forum on SDGs with national development planning agencies, ASEAN China UNDP Symposium on SDGs. This year it will be on youth and their roles uh, in advancing SDGs in the decade of um, through the decade of action. And the last one is, of course, the establishment of the ASEAN Center on Sustainable Development Studies and Dialogue uh, based in uh, Bangkok. Next slide, please. So um, these are uh, what we call the knowledge product um, that um, is part of our work uh, on the SDG. So apart from, of course, all the policy dialogues, um, we are are uh, striving to also strengthen our uh, analytical um, capacity as well as to um, enhance our data system and um, knowledge, um, the knowledge production uh, on SDGs that belong uh, to the ASEAN region. So here, um, the knowledge building, um, some of the initiatives on uh, knowledge building are the ASEAN Gender Outlook. So we launched this on the uh, 1st of March. So it is uh, the report that look at all the uh, SDGs to the lens uh, of gender, including a section uh, that tackles um, COVID-19 uh, 
through the lens of gender and women's empowerment. So it's also available on our website. And the ASEAN SDGs Indicators Baseline Report 2020. So this is uh, the earnest effort from the ASEAN Economic uh, Pillar uh, that tried to um, establish a certain um, measures and indicators to track the progress of SDGs uh, in the region. And through the sectoral regional cooperation, uh, again, with the support and friendship uh, from uh, Asia DRA, the Framework of Action Plan on Rural Development and Poverty Eradication uh, 2021 to 2025 uh, is being finalized. Next slide, please. So here, I think this is the last slide already. So through all these uh, initiatives, including uh, the ASEAN regional responses to COVID-19, uh, the ASEAN regional um, plan to recover from the COVID-19, as well as ASEAN efforts in advancing the SDGs. We understand the importance uh, of multi-stakeholder partnerships, and this is the SDG itself. Uh, in one of the goals of the SDG. So uh, preserving the development gains of ASEAN community inte integration amidst the pandemic, that is uh, the purpose, but also um, the outcome of the partnership in order to harness the power of partnerships at all levels to inform and shape inclusive policies and program as well as resources mobilization. We put resources mobilization here as uh, to even um, achieve one SDG, it's not an easy task and we need uh, investment and resources in doing so. Uh, the second is uh, to implement an inclusive and resilient recovery agenda. I think resilience has um, has uh, emerged as uh, a very important uh, agenda uh, since um, the outset of the COVID-19 pandemic. And by engaging with multi-stakeholders, uh, multi-stakeholder partners, uh, we build on and strengthen, and strengthen stakeholder engagement so that no one is uh, left behind. And last uh, but not least, uh, to adapt to the new normal towards achieving the SDGs. So this is to chart a broader development agenda in the post-COVID-19 pandemic, as the pandemic itself has unearthed a lot of uh, new or previously slightly invisible uh, development agenda for uh, that uh, for the region to start pay attention, paying attention to, or at least to start acknowledging and addressing uh, those issues. And this is to realize the ASEAN Community Vision 2025, as well as um, the uh, SDGs agenda. So uh, if I'm not uh, mistaken, this is already the last slide that we would like to um, present. And thank you very much again, for having the ASEAN Secretariat, me and Ajing here uh, to join this side event. Over to you, Malin. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sita, for the very informative walkthrough about ASEAN's actions on COVID-19 and the SDGs. And we're grateful that you could have all those in one go. Uh, and a good note that uh, the materials are available for follow through but uh, very instructive as well are the ex presence or existence of various mechanisms within the ASEAN community that are working on these issues that, and that possibly uh, civil society organizations and other regional organizations could explore uh, and, and work with uh, in the coming period on the, in, 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 on the same agenda. We, I take note of the importance you put on harnessing the power of partnerships at all levels to inform and shape inclusive policies and programs as well as resource mobilization, which is, I think, as equally important for all of us. So thank you to all our speakers for giving us this uh, heady feeling of the many things happening around us. Yet, uh, if we try to connect with each or what each of us is doing, we could relate and find connection. And uh, so we are here to build understanding so that in knowing uh, what each one is doing, that uh, we can be encouraged, uh, we can be inspired to move forward faster and together. So now we are checking on our time. We are actually now uh, 
uh, overextending by or late by 30 minutes. But uh, we hope that uh, we can uh, extend our time given the disruption that we had at the start. So we'd like to now go to the, our, the participation of uh, many others virtually. And uh, we have received a number of questions via the, drop, the chat box. Thank you for those questions. We will um, look into those questions later. But at the moment, we'd like to uh, know if you wish to speak, you can kindly raise your hand via the emotic um, emoticon button. So uh, the tech team can we help monitor uh, if there are hands raised. No hands raised for the moment. Oh. Okay. Uh, so while uh, waiting for that, I'd like to um, go back to our panelists. There are uh, a number of questions, about 10 of them, but uh, can be clustered uh, on, uh, well, question on how can, how to work together to, to support smallholder producers during the pandemic of uh, COVID-19 uh, in terms of uh, the, the dif different stages of the value chain. And uh, I think uh, our uh, colleague from the Asian Farmers Association can respond to that. Similar question uh, along that on methodology to help small farmers on financial inclusion. Uh, there's a clarification whether the SDGs, targets, uh, and strategies will be amended uh, uh, in the uh, context of the pandemic. And uh, how can we have clear guide for participation to work together uh, after the event? And that's linked to the last three questions on uh, effective way to increase solidarity among people to increase uh, economy and uh, how different multi-stakeholders can work together to ensure uh, climate action, and uh, especially in looking at government priorities for economic recovery post the pandemic. And uh, another question is on the uh, available mechanisms platforms that are technologically friendly, especially for rural communities, especially for women, uh, so that they are also not left behind, that they can participate in the process. Uh, I think these are just, there's a, a specific question from Southeast Asia, refugees uh, who are not uh, recognized as legal resident, how can they also uh, be uh, looked into in the context of uh, no one uh, leaving behind? So these are some questions that uh, I'd like to bring back to our resource persons and uh, we have five panelists and I would like to also add that as you respond to some of those questions about participation, uh, especially on rural poor and the mechanisms, uh, a related question that uh, the panelists could, could uh, respond is on what are the mechanisms in the region that could support the follow-up and review of possible conditions acts we heard about agroecology, the UN decade on family farming, post-COVID-19 recovery, sectoral approaches, the voluntary national reviews that I understand a uh, APSD is uh, supporting, among others. And uh, other than this, what are the priority policy instruments in the region by regional associations, UN bodies, attached agents, uh, ASEAN, that could be optimized to foster multi-sectorial and multi-stakeholder cooperation in support of SDG implementation and the challenges of the pandemic. So, uh, um, we go back to our speakers and, and of course, from also open for a uh, response coming from the floor. If you could give us your uh, response and maybe your concluding message uh, uh, as we move closer to the end of our discussion. So may I uh, start with um, 
Sita, Dr. Sita. Yes, okay, unmute. So, um, yes, Malin. so I, I, I understand that I can choose the questions that I would like to answer, correct? <laughs> yes. yes, so that, so that I but answer. You have, you have two to three minutes. You have oh, two, two okay. minutes. Okay, okay. So, <laughs> So um, I think for, for, for me, I will uh, go for number nine um, on the multi-stakeholders um, and the climate actions um, on this one. Uh, and for me, it's just the update uh, from uh, the ASEAN site that uh, the, for, for, for us, um, the, the starting um, the starting point is, of course, uh, to recognize climate actions as the cross-sectoral uh, efforts. Um, and apart from the rural uh, development and poverty sector, uh, this is also an important uh, agenda for the agriculture and forestry uh, sector. And slowly, this is going into uh, the areas or the territories of the women, children, as well as, um, of course, the environment, that's, the, uh, that's a given as well as the disaster uh, sectors of ASEAN. So I think apart from the policy advocacy, uh, there needs to be uh, a solid data and evidence to show um, how um, all these stakeholders will need to come together as climate action, of course, go beyond SDG uh, 13, uh, and it also affects the real people, and the real people can also help with the mitigation of the uh, climate change. So this is how we are doing it um, at the ASEAN level. So just the uh, update from my end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sita. So, and uh, may I ask Anselmo, and uh, maybe remembering your important uh, reminder in your presentation on how we are able to connect the work, especially of farmers organization, the agriculture sector, to these important SDGs. And so what are the mechanisms? No? What are the important steps that we have to do so that there's convergence? Anselmo? Can you allow me? Okay, now it's okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity again. Um, as I stress uh, very much the, the mainstreaming SDG 16 plus and 17, when I look at, the, for instance, ASEAN, the SDG, the indicator benchmark, baseline, uh, because only one the target out of 12, you know, that shows that SG16 has been neglected by many the government in ASEAN countries. So, th so that's why I think we need to have a really good strategy because traditionally speaking, many people say, oh, uh, agriculture goal two, urban goal 11, very convenient till they fragment, you know, but when it comes to partnership, the mm -hmm. goal to should go to the 11, that means the urban and rural, you know, there's a consumer uh, and the producer. I think this paradigm solidarity is very important. In this also linked to the 1717 mm -hmm. multi-stakeholder partnership, but we need to also make sure that five and 10, gender and economic inequality as well, you know, so that way we can overcome the fragmentation approach uh, by many the, the groups. So I hope uh, APSD can contribute to um, really go beyond this uh, silo approach. Thank you. Good, thank you Anselmo. So we hope to see more face in the future conversations with the agriculture and rural development sector. Um, may I call on Maalini? There's a very specific question here about uh, issues of uh, people uh, affected by statelessness, and uh, of course, uh, I'd like to hear your concluding uh, message as representative um, of the network. Actually, I don't know if I missed out on statelessness, but if you're referring on question number seven, is that the one? It's on refugees there. Mm. Yeah. So yes. I'll respond for refugees. Um, so it says here that refugees in Southeast Asia are not recognized as legal residents. They do not have anything to do with their sustainability. So how can the forum make the region in helping every single human being's inclusion in sustainable development process? Um, I think um, this is very similar to the stateless group or the undocumented group that we work with. Um, we had increasingly saw, in fact, uh, 
you know, how governments prioritized citizen first approach in um, any assistance that was given in any of the countries that was involved in the crisis um, per se, where any uh, type of support that was given. So I really think um, whether it's a uh, non-governmental organization, civil society organization, NGIs, and the people who are actually working to provide uh, to not choose uh, obviously, we'll have to equally provide for every individual, and that's exactly how Drum Malaysia also did when it came to, um, you know, putting all vulnerable groups, regardless of the citizenship, their status as an individual, um, their basic necessity as a priority, um, rather than whether they have a citizenship or no citizenship. So once that initiative starts from us, um, and I think uh, DRA also came across many of the funders who are, who are insisting that it should be only Malaysians alone um, uh, assistance. So we tried to sort of, um, you know, um, give them some awareness, some education on how important it is to include everyone. So I think um, really it's us um, educating each other and it's definitely possible and it's you and me who is who has to educate, uh, whether it's the donors or the uh, private sectors um, involved in um, channeling this support. So I would say that. Okay, thank you Malini. Uh, for that very specific, very uh, inf inspiring initiative or work being done by Malaysia, uh, Drum Malaysia. Uh, Esther, uh, may we invite you to the floor? Uh, there are a number of questions here coming from uh, farmers organization on how they can actually be involved in this various uh, COVID-19 recovery reconstruction processes. Yes, uh, thank you, Marlene. So basically, I think the first thing that we need to do as farmers organizations and farmers groups in each country is to band together, to have networking among each other and to consolidate our voices so that we can have a common stand and a common agenda when we partner or engage with our government, with other NGOs, with private sector, and uh, with even research institutions. And we're doing that right now. IFAD is supporting the Asia Pacific Farmers Program where farmers uh, organizations are networking with each other. They have a national country platform you know, where they try to work uh, to prioritize their uh, actions, their uh, their demands to, to government as well as prioritize the economic activities uh, including uh, supporting their members to enter into the value chain activities. So in terms of uh, small uh, financial inclusion, again, that, that is really very dependent on the, on the farmers uh, first on their own, on their own organizing, because uh, when we, when farmers organizations become very strong cooperatives they are able to provide financial services such as loans uh, capital for their members you now we we see that in many in many strong cooperatives that we have in philippines in india okay but also if farm if uh, the farmers organizations are organized they can also talk for example with their banks and with their government to uh, uh, make policies so that the financial services can can include uh, can support the family uh, farmers at the at the country level we are also looking at the uh, for establishment of national committees on family farming it can be led by uh, civil society organizations by farmers organizations in at the start, but once that the National Committee on Family Farmer is a bit strong, a bit more organized, then they can start to engage the, go the government counterpart because uh, uh, there are many government agencies who have already signified intention to make uh, national action plans for the UN for the implementation of the decade of family farming in their country. So we need to be there. And so that, our, so that we can influence this process, we need to get organized and we get to build our 
we need to build our capacities for policy work you know, with the government. And I think many NGOs are doing that. And Selma, you talked about multi-stakeholder partnership. Uh, farmers, there's um, many of the, the examples already of farmers organizations and cooperatives partnering with consumers groups for direct marketing of their products, for example, or partnering with a government uh, even for providing financial services, partnering with a funding institution like what we have made as an example, the Global Agriculture Food Security Program, where farmers organizations and CSOs are in the steering committee uh, or uh, part of, that, of deciding how these funds are made. So we hope also that, for example, if ASEAN, if uh, other, uh, other NGOs get the right to get that privilege to hold funds, no? Uh, for, in, for, for the in behalf of the CSOs and farmers organizations that you put farmers organizations as equal partner in the governance uh, processes because that is also what we need to to feel no, that farmers organizations are recognized as equal partner not just as beneficiaries in all these projects and all these programs thank you great Thank you. Thank you, Esther, and uh, especially for uh, introducing this important venue for participation through the UN Decade of Family Farming as uh, animated by the national action plans uh, that should come out from the national uh, multi-stakeholder, multi-sector process at the national level. Now, uh, back to you, Pierre. Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah. Actually, I'd like to follow up on uh, what Esther mentioned, especially for the UN decade of family farming, since it is uh, supported by FAO and the IFAD. And uh, I think the global action plan that was devised for the UN decade of family farming is still very much relevant in the context of the pandemic, and it offers a very good framework with uh, to implement activities that are going to support all the, the stakeholders. And especially in the, de the national declination, the national action plan, I mean, there is a huge opportunity to, uh, to build process that are as inclusive as possible and as mm. multi-stakeholder as possible. And to complement this, the other uh, ongoing process that is very synergetic and uh, very important is all the national COVID-19 recovery plan that are being developed uh, at country level in the region because they offer good opportunities to further support the engagement of all stakeholders, especially family farmers organization or uh, farmer association. And through this uh, recovery plan, I mean, most of them are addressing somehow strengthening the resilience of family farmers. As mentioned, to consider farmer organization as direct partner and not just beneficiaries. So it's really important to uh, ensure their full participation but also this recovery plan should mainstream uh, sustainable approaches like agroecology. As I mentioned earlier, I mean, agroecology has the potential to not only address the impact of COVID-19, but to address also the impact of climate change. And um, so one of the, um, the, the needs at the moment also is really to invest in a um, in training in education regarding agroecology from farmers to uh, farmer organization and to link also with, uh, with universities and research institutes to create this multi-stakeholder platform that can uh, really enable transforming the, the food system. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much uh, for that, Pierre. Uh, a, a good uh, wrapping up. And uh, at this point, I'd like all of us to thank our uh, panelists as we move to the closing uh, uh, activity, and uh, we have that we have been uh, filled by with the uh, inputs uh, coming from uh, different perspectives, farmers' organization, from regional CSOs, NGOs, as well as intergovernmental organization and a UN agency. So. Uh, within our uh, round table, we have a multi-stakeholder uh, community and we hope that we, this can be broadened and, and that for those who are uh, in, in this uh, conversation, we look forward to be able to continue our discussion together. Now it's time to mirror back to us our conversations from the lens of 
our development graphic artist, Kiko Miranda. So we hope that uh, this will help us remember as we envision our next journeys together. So Kiko, you have the floor. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Kiko Miranda. I am the graphic recorder and I was and I will be presenting with you or sharing with you um, the big picture or the highlights of the, um, today's forum. So we started off our session with um, five different panelists who shared um, different topics um, regarding um, multi-stakeholder partnerships. We started, our first speaker was Mr. Pierre Ferrand from FAO, and he talked about building back greener and more, how to build back greener and more resilient. He shared with us some impacts on, of COVID-19 and agriculture, such as movement restrictions, losses on disposable income, unavailability of migrant workers, severe impacts on food supply, the lack of seed and fertilizer, and the temporary closure of hotels, markets, schools, etc. He proceeded to share with us agroecological approaches for a greener, more resilient, and more inclusive new normal. He highlighted three points, um, three approaches rather. First approach is the creation of decent agricultural jobs. The second approach is replacing external inputs. And the third approach is um, connecting farmers to consumers, which um, he also um, highlighted the importance of the e-commerce platform that has been emerging um, due to the pandemic. Our second speaker is Ms. Esther, Esther Penunia from um, the Asian Farmers Association for Sustainable Rural Development. And she shared with us initiatives of family family farming organizations. These are some of the initiatives which she highlighted in her sharing. Um, the face uh, provision of face masks to consumers and LGU, the establishment of setting up a farmer's market with labor unions, government seeds to farmer, the extension of services, the partnership with communities, um, the direct selling of to consumers by an all-women IP co-op named Kagat, um, the inclusive governance structure and visual call centers. Our third speaker was Ms. Maalani Ramalo, and she shared with us the promise of territorial rural development. Her five key summaries were education and information campaigns, small scale psychosocial services, diversification of agricultural production, small social infrastructure, improvement of social protection system, calibration of marketing and business plans, and virtual learning exchanges. Our second to the last speaker was Mr. Anselmo Lee from the Asia Civil Society Partnership for Sustainable Development, and he talked about CSOs on COVID-19 and SDGs. He discussed about enablers and accelerators, um, the different means of implementation implementation and the different systemic issues present. Our last speaker is Ms. Rodora Babaran from the CN Secretariat presented by um, Dr. Sita Sumrit. And um, she shared with us um, the, the, the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework covering the different objectives of the framework, the different principles of the framework and some broad strategies. And for the last, um, and for the last um, big picture summary, these are just some key messages and opportunities for partnership shared throughout the forum. Some of the key messages um, focused on agroecology as an approach to build community resilience the key roles that RPOs play in relief, rehab, and reconstruction needs, the institutionalization of territorial rural development plan, optimizing multi-stakeholder platform, recognizing climate action, women's participation, resource mobilization, ura rural, ura urban rural convergence, priori the pr prioritization of citizens' first approach, networking with partners, and the UN Decade of Family Farming as a Framework. 
the common message shared across the across different across the conversation is that no one should be left behind and nothing about about us without us and i see this as as each organization is a piece of a very important puzzle which we have to piece together to converge and to collaborate more to see a more sustainable future for every family farmer it has been a pleasure drawing the big picture with you thank you thank you so i hope you were able to i summer discuss today of our side event we allow us to thank our fellow organizers afa fao apd asean secretariat and of course asia dra and ask us to share and celebrate our work to drumbeat our advocacies thank you to all of you for sharing us your time and valuable contribution and last but not least thank you to our millennial technical team quick action and saving us the day wave your hands irish of pakistan of Af and from um, uh, my colleagues in asia dra jenny rc luchi and many asian hands made this uh, event possible we will be sending you the link uh, post event for the material and the presentation from our session thank you very much thank you bye bye Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Kiko. Thank you, Ma Marlene. Thank you, everyone.